All right. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third installment of Dreaming of a New Collections Management System, and thank you for joining our discussion today. My name is Alex, Cron Alex Cron, and on behalf, behalf of Balboa Park Online Collaborative, BPOC, I am moderating today's webinar. I am BPOC's Digital Projects and Collections Specialist. For those of you just joining this webinar series, our previous sessions discussed challenges around managing collections data and collections management systems from the perspective of consultants in the field and cultural institution staff. Today's webinar, our discussion will be a deeper dive into the more technical challenges faced by those working in and with cultural institutions. This session is being recorded, captioning and transcription is available. If you guys are having any issues with that, please message me. Um, the session will be, rec the recording session will be available on our social media channels and shared across listservs. Uh, so before we get started, I would like to introduce our panelists. So today we have with us Jack Ludden, BPOC's Senior Strategist and Innovation, Special, or Innovation Specialist. Jack, give a little wave. Jack has been a part of the cultural heritage community for more than 30 years as a digital advocate, communication specialist, and a design user experience leader. For 15 years, Jack has worked at the Getty where he, has, he was head of digital experience and new media development. Jack works closely with content and technical experts alike to create productive work environments that produce exceptional visitor experiences. Next, we have Dan Brennan, if you wanna give a little wave. Dan is the museum application developer at the Princeton University Art Museum. Since 2016 at the Princeton University Art Museum, Dan has managed the museum's data and images services and underlying systems architecture in support of a wide variety of activities, both internal and external, that call for programmatic access to collection data. Prior to that, he was in the department, digital department at Metropolitan Museum of Art for four years as part of the collections information team, focusing primarily on digital asset management systems and workflows. He lives in Brooklyn, New York. Next, we have Richard Light, software specialist, independent consultant. Uh, Richard is software specialist lead advisor for the Modes Museum cataloging software. He has been involved with museum documentation standards for a long time, having previously worked for the MDA, now Collections Trust. He maintains an interest in the international documentation scene through participation in ICOM's International Committee, CDOC. When not doing museum things, Richard is chair of the Free UK Genealogy Charity, which transcribes genealogical information and makes it available online for free. Very cool. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Steen DuPont. He's program manager at the Natural History Museum in London. Dr. DuPont focuses on digital governance and the ongoing RECODE program that is currently analyzing the institutional collections management system requirements and needs. Alongside RECODE, Steen still devotes time to the award-winning Natural History Museum's digital collections program through innovation and invention, entomological research, and most things Lego. So these are our panelists today, and I'm gonna go ahead and let Jack open up the discussion for us today. Thanks, Alex. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. That is just awesome that there's so many people everywhere. Um, so um, this will sound a little strange, but when you're sort of dreaming of the new of the new collection management system, right? So what's that bird's eye view? And one of the things that I have found and I have just been sort of obsessed with is um, the notion of a journey map, which uh, which um, I'm just going to put a couple examples on the on the um, on the screen for you all. And you're, of course, some of you may be familiar with a journey map and you're like, what does that have anything to do with a collection uh, management system, right? Um, but actually, um, and it kind of just got me thinking uh, about kind of why, it, if a journey map is about how does perhaps a, a, an organization have certain touch points with a customer or with a visitor, I said to myself, well, wait a minute, how, how, can maybe you can sort of flip that around or look at it slightly differently and say, well, 
can we potentially look at a, uh, a, a, a work of art or a collection? So how does a collection, here, I'll make this a little bigger if folks can, um, can perhaps see it better. Um, and so this idea sort of, I, I got this idea and I sort of, I desperately wanted to visualize it to kind of help myself and frankly put help uh, people in the field. I, I found this to be an incredibly useful way to, for a couple of things. One is to provide a shared vision and sort of a set of um, sort of internal expect, uh, expectations, right? Like sometimes when we, when we think about a, 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 a CMS is sometimes we see it only being a particular number of people within the organization. To say it kind of simply or in a different way, it can get siloed. I'm sure we're all sort of familiar with what that can be like. And so this idea of being able to kind of get that bird's eye view, that back view, and then be able to, to kind of understand kind of this, the, what, what that ecosystem looks like can be really useful for people, depending on where they're working and what they're, and what they're doing. Um, the other thing that it can start doing is that it can, uh, help understand, again, one, well, first one, the people who are involved. And, and, and so I, I sort of put a very sort of thin sort of this notion of like, sort of what experts and professionals and staff are, 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 are involved. Then, then you, what you can do is you kind of layer in, well, what type of activities might be going on, right? What type of activities are happening along the way, right? If you've got that object, it's a purchase, it's a loan, it's a gift, it's, it's undigitized. Okay, what, if, what happens along that way? What happens when it's getting captured? What happens when it's initially documented? And then of course you can see the preservation or publishing and of course use, right? So ultimately like once these really important things happen sort of internally, we, we wanna kind of release it to the world and how is it being used? And all of these have particular people, right? Experts and all of them have certain activities. And then now, and, and I think this is kind of getting to, to, to uh, a critical point for today's conversation is, and then sort of what technologies and frankly put what type of challenges do you might find along the way? And again, this has been, a re I, I found these, a journey map of this nature to be really useful to kind of unify a team, maybe provide uh, an understanding to those who maybe don't understand the technologies as well. It's just been really useful, right? So this idea of like, again, you can kind of move left to right in, in this particular instance, this idea of like, okay, well, what's the metadata integrity? Or how do you perhaps do onboarding or training? How do you leverage automated workflows? Um, what does restricted or limited access look like? Um, where are you, do, where, how, where types of uh, derivative files might you have? How do you uh, tackle uh, internal discoverability the, oh my goodness, the most important thing, you know, this idea of APIs and how to ultimately do you provide access um, outside the system. Um, customized workflows. Uh, one of the things that I'm sort of constantly obsessed with is this idea of like the interpretive material, like how do you connect that interpretive material and what type of technologies and systems and processes do you need there? Backing up the all important notion of governance, right? Uh, and then of course the notion of upgrading configurations. I'm just highlighting a few things here, but I think you see the point where again, you sort of have this, again, this, this journey of this object where all of us in the museum community are somehow involved with that journey, right? And I've just found this to be a really effective way uh, to identify and share and then ultimately, which is, you know, the, the, the goal perhaps is to, certainly for many of us on this call, is this notion of prioritizing the work and sort of tackling uh, the things that we might need to get done. So I just wanted to kind of frame it and kind of uh, sort of put that out there as a, as a, as a um, as a, as a way of kind of, again, sort of a bird's eye view of kind of how you can sort of tackle and kind of look at some of these things and, and start addressing some of the, the challenges and opportunities that are out there. Okay, enough for me. I am now going to, I can't point over, but I'm pointing over to Dan. So Dan, over to you, and I'm gonna make sure I mute myself because the last thing you need to hear me do is cough. Okay. Uh, just real quick before you get going, Dan, I did forget to mention that we will have a Q&A at the end after everyone, after everyone has a chance to talk. Um, I just noticed the question in the chat, so I just wanted to make sure that everyone knew that. All right, Dan, hit it. Thanks, Alex, uh, and thanks, Jack. Um, and thanks to the awesome folks at PPOC for doing this whole series. I've been a spectator on the first two, and they've been just like super cool and super informative and thought provoking. Um, so I appreciate the, the opportunity to be in this third forum. Um, and this is cool because, you know, content management systems, particularly with the technical challenges around them are not a thing that we talk about a whole lot in constructive ways, I would say. We 
we get together, we gripe about them, you know, we grumble, but we don't sort of imagine what if they didn't exist, what would it look like? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think about content management systems kind of in the same way I think about the subway in certain ways where um, a collection management system is getting me from point A to point B, but I'm never really excited about using it. Um, it's just a thing that exists that's functional for me. Um, and so when I was putting together my thoughts for this conversation, it was like, what would it take to get me really excited about, about a collection management system and the ways that I work with it? Um, so I'll try, I'll try to enumerate that the best that I can. Um, as, as Alex mentioned, I am an application developer at Princeton, um, which mainly means that most of my work day to day exists on the periphery of the collection management system. I'm not a person who spends a lot of time directly inside of it. Um, and that was true of my time at the Met as well, really. Um, I work, you know, if we go back to Jack's map, my work exists before it, after it, on top of it, behind it. Um, so it's very cool to be able to kind of like pinpoint on a, on a document like that where, where I live. Um, but there are really three different ways that I interact with our collection management system at my museum on the regular. Um, and I'll talk about those and use those to frame my, my conversation here. Uh, I am a developer, I am a systems administrator, and I am a, what I would call museum data enthusiast. So just someone who thinks that museum data is cool. And so there are inherent challenges to working with question management systems in all of these contexts. Um, and I'll start with the first one. So as a developer, I spend my time building tools and services that exist adjacent to the collection management system and interact with it in a variety of ways. Most commonly, these are products that rely upon the data stored in the system and you know, have a need to extract and transform it for the needs of downstream applications. So some very basic examples of that would be like our online collection search, our online object pages, um, reporting functionality, things like that. Occasionally, less frequently, but with increasing frequent, I build things that are meant to invoke or augment the functions of the collection management system itself. Um, and so examples of this that we've worked with would be like specialized cataloging forms that are on the web that then round trip data back into the system. Um, at LACMA, I know they have a system that handles object moves that works in a similar fashion. So there are things like this out there that people are doing. And the question is, what are, what are the challenges inherent to those efforts? And there's one main challenge that Jack already kind of mentioned, and it's the need to access these systems in programmatic ways that are not purely through the user interface. Um, and that gets to APIs, you know, and a hash mark for every time we say API in this session. Generally, when, when I'm doing this, I'm doing it by circumventing the system itself completely and accessing the data storage that sits behind it. This is functional and it works, but I wouldn't say that it's ideal in a lot of ways. Um, and it's mostly not ideal because the system is not aware that I'm actually doing that. Um, if I update, delete, you know, modify a bunch of records, there's no system function that's gonna ask me, are you sure you wanna do that? Maybe, or is this a mistake? There's no catch there. Um, so we're just now kind of reaching a point, I would say with museum developers, CMS vendors, being on the same page about recognizing kind of the need for robust read write APIs for these systems. And I think that's very encouraging and you know something that in the last few years has really picked up and been carried by a lot of people. So to the extent that certain museums have been able to leverage their collection information in the types of products I build downstream or upstream from the CMS, um, it's often been in spite of the CMS and not actually encouraged by it. And that comes obviously at increased cost and resource. Um, and those are, that's money, that's people, that's time. Um, I'm gonna come back to that point later because it's important. So some other points for improvement that I would identify. Um, the first of these has to do with kind of, again, driven by the API question, integrations. Um, building integrations that acknowledge the reality that collection management systems serve certain functions very well but that they don't exist in a vacuum and that there are always going to be domain specific systems that support certain activities that need access to collection information better than you know, a centralized collection management system. This kind of one system to rule them all uh, notion, I think undercuts the effectiveness of these systems and ignores the fact that, excuse me one second, I'm very dry right now. <laughs> Mm 
You know, undercuts, as I was saying, undercuts the effectiveness of the system and ignores the fact that different collection specific activities at the museum have wildly varying user requirements and functional needs. Um, furthermore, about documentation, we as managers of these systems should be able to articulate clearly what the foundational concepts of the systems are and how they relate to each other. This would better allow users to determine where the CMS should fit inside of an overall systems architecture and create a community of open exchange around use cases and examples. Um, do you mind, Alex, if I pause right there for a second? I'm getting a phone call that's somewhat very important. <laughs> yeah, no, go for it. Richard, why don't you carry on for us? Okay, hi, I'm Richard Light. So from the other side of the Atlantic, um, the UK. Um, as Alex mentioned, I'm responsible for a cataloging system in the UK, which is called Modes. And um, the reason why I got interested in contributing to today's talks is that basically I am dreaming, dreaming of a collections management system. That's what I'm, I'm doing right now. And, and the reason for that is that we are currently having got a major new release of Modes out the door, taking a big step back and thinking about the technological basis that we're working on and where we might go in the future. So it's, it's a great time to actually have big thoughts just sort of learn the lessons from the past and think where we might be going. So I'm in that mindset and the broad conclusion I'm drawing at the moment is that the, the system we've got is, is very successful in what it's doing, but it's basically a cataloging system. So it's, it's used by lots and lots of small museums in the UK. Um, and it's very good at letting them get their records in and find stuff and print out reports um, of individual records they're interested in. Um, it's less helpful if they actually want to manage their collection. So I've, I've been thinking about that aspect of what Modes does and how we could actually help to make it work better. And so in the course of doing that, I've been thinking about, well, what actually does collections management involve? Now, as Jack was saying, um, to some extent, it involves a journey, stuff moves back and forth. Um, and as Dan was saying, it's not sort of an island all to itself, it's got a link into other things as well. Um, but the, the, the key point about collections management is that it's event-based. It's about stuff that needs to get done. And the trouble is that you start off saying, I want to do this loan. So I want to loan this object out. But that task immediately snowballs into lots of other tasks because before you can loan the object out, you've got to check it and check this in a condition to loan out. You've got to do all these sort of admin legal stuff. Um, in order to check it, you need to move it. And so what starts out as one task suddenly becomes about 300 tasks all of which you need to get to the end of before you can actually do the thing you first wanted to do. And the order in which you do these tasks may not be that critical, but you do need to get them all done. So you end up with a system where basically you start the tasks off and then just check that each one is actually ticked off and done before you can move on to other tasks within the system. And so my sort of mental vision of a really good collections management system is one that helps you do this and lets you spawn new tasks and keeps track of deadlines, keeps track of who's meant to be doing certain jobs and whether they've actually got that on their to-do list. Um, and it's very much about the sort of flow of work. Now, as I say, our, our experience is that we, we built a system for the museums. They're very happy with it, but the management side could be done a lot better. And I'd be interested to hear what other people's experience is in, in that sort of area. Um, another sort of learning point that I can bring to this is I've been involved with museum data for more years than I care to remember. 
and there's a whole question about the nature of museum data. Um, it's not like all other data it tends to be very variable. Potentially, it can be very complex. Um, there's an awful lot of uncertainty that you're wanting to record in there. It's not this fact, that fact. It's maybe between this year and this year. Um, and you need to be able to record the degree of uncertainty and the degree that you are sure about stuff in, in your data. So it presents um, challenges for recording, which go beyond what your, your normal database um, will comfortably let you deal with. Um, I mean, for modes, what we've actually done is we've gone to XML and we actually store all of our modes data as XML records, which is unusual. I'd imagine it's unique, but um, that, that works well for us and gives us that flexibility that, that we're actually seeking. Um, another feature of museum data is that if you ask curators, they really want to be consistent. They want to be self-consistent in their own recording, but they also want to be consistent with other people. Uh, in order to do that, you need authorities that they can turn to that will actually give them the right term for a particular concept. And again, I think there's a, a point of interest there where you've got established frameworks like the Getty's vocabularies. Um, you've got the nomenclature system, which is widely used, I know, in North America. Uh, which is now available as um, open data and shortly as linked data. And it's interesting to think about the extent to which the system you're using will let you actually grab these resources and use them in your cataloging work. Um, so that's sort of the standard data, but then of course there's other stuff. So in the course of running a museum, as well as having database type data, you end up with a lot of textual data. You end up with an awful lot of images and maybe um, other multimedia resources. And again, your, your system has to cope with that somehow. Now, as Dan was saying, you don't necessarily have to pile all of that into the collections management system. You could potentially have a federated set of linked systems which will specialize and each do a particular job well and then feed the results back into the core system that you, you're working from. So you know, potentially for media resources you could have a separate digital asset management system um, or you could try and build it within again the core collections management system. Then having got your data, there's the question of pushing it out there. So what sort of integration is there between your collections management system and your web publishing face? So you'll have a museum website, you'll have the opening hours, you have all the shiny description of the facilities. Uh, but what about collection search? Is that something which the collections management system is effortlessly pushing through into your web interface? Um, or does it involve a massive copying across of data, reformatting it and pushing it into some entirely different system? And if it's that, then does that mean it's a job you've got to remember to do every three months, otherwise the data's out of date? So challenges around that sort of public facing aspect of the data that you're actually working with and the other aspect of museum data is that we obviously all focus on objects it's an object based environment but there are other entity types that come in that are crucial to making the whole thing hang together and work so an obvious one is locations um, within the museum so you know where is that object if you say well it's in room 15 store 45 shelf b that's fine if you know where that room and that shelf actually are, but um, you need to have that. You, you need your storage system actually documented itself before you can actually place objects in, in both senses within that locational system. The people involved in running your system, again, are crucial and knowing who can do what job, what they're allowed to do, what they're capable of doing is an important part of the system and all that information should be readily available and help drive 
how you manage your work. And more generally, there are events, as I've mentioned, the collections management events, but there are also historical events. Um, and you may want your system to actually give you a broader perspective on what's been happening in the world and the place of the museum collection objects within that broader picture. So there are, there are lots of interesting aspects of the data itself and how it all hangs together that, that we could talk about. Um, and the final sort of theme that I'd like to bring in, I've entitled No Museum is an Island. So any museum has to have interactions. It has to have interactions with other museums. So if it's, as I mentioned earlier, lending objects to them, borrowing objects, um, so a lot of information has to flow between the institutions before that loan can actually happen. At the very least, there needs to be a loan agreement. Um, there are now standards being developed to actually help that happen. So the, the CDOC group that I'm involved with is finalising a standard called EODEM, which is the Exhibition Object Data Exchange Model. And this is a standard way of describing collections objects that you want to exchange between museums. And, and the idea is that collections system vendors will actually implement EODEM import and export facilities within their systems so that you can then actually push a button and have your records pushed out in EODEM format, ready to send to the borrower. And, and when the data comes in, there's another button to press to load that loan material into your system without actually having to copy, paste, retype, reformat all of that data. So the, the development of standards can actually help us do our job much more efficiently. Then there are interactions with the other professionals involved in this area. So conservation studios, transport firms, insurers. Again, they all need information from you about the material that you're asking them to work with. And again, there needs to be a means of getting that information out as efficiently as possible. And, and um, so as to move the, the whole process forward. Then there's your public. So we, we've talked about collection search already, but there's this whole social media thing. Um, so the public out there have opinions and they're not slow to express them. To what extent are you engaging with those opinions and to what extent is your collections management system plugged into those dialogues? Is there a means of getting opinions and indeed expert knowledge out of the public through social media and into your collections management system because a lot of people out there know a lot of stuff about the specialist material you've got so there's an opportunity there but you you know you need to be able to take advantage of it um tra uh, tra crowdsourcing as, as a mechanism is now an increasingly popular way of taking a neglected primary source um, and getting it digitized and again if you can integrate that to your systems, you can harness the enthusiasm of hundreds of volunteers to actually get new machine processable data into your system. Then there's other museums as a sort of broader picture. Um, a lot of projects in the past, such as in, on our side of the Atlantic, the Europeana project, um, aim to pull together data from lots of museums and present a big online resource that's searchable. Um, are you in a position to contribute to that sort of collaborative exercise? Um, do you provide a, an individual search mechanism that could be integrated into a distributed search? Um, again, you know, there are various ways to tackle it, but you need to think about how your collection could actually take part in a broader picture of the museum resources that are available worldwide. And towards that goal, there is the whole idea of identifying each of the objects in your collection in a unique 
persistent way. And if your collections management system provides you with a means to provide a unique persistent URL for every object in your collection, and if that URL <laughs> is actionable, so that as you click on that link, you actually get the data back, then you've effectively bookmarked your collection for the internet. And that means that other people can start to talk about your objects. They can use your URLs to refer to that object. And you can start to build up a corpus of knowledge about what's been done to your collection by other people and what they've found out. And that, I think, adds enormously to the potential um, that your collections management system can contribute not just to your own knowledge but to everyone else's as well that's me okay that was great thank you richard all right uh dan let's circle back to you and then we'll we'll um go on to steen Thank, thanks for skipping around and accommodating nothing no like, no problem nothing like a morning emergency to crop up life, times <laughs> life life happens like like everyone yes life is happening extra these days <laughs> So I think, I think I left off talking about, um, I wrapped up the context of being a developer who works with these systems and I was getting into the system administrator side of things. And so as a system administrator, I consider it my role to make sure that the system is configured in the most effective way to serve the greatest number of users as possible and to provide a stable, consistent user experience and to support the growing set of business processes at my museum that both require access to and generate collection information. And so that said, the main thing that is a challenge with these systems that I've worked with that I would like to see is I would like them to move in a direction that's much more user focused. Um, and some of that is UX and some of that is other things. Um, in the last session, Jeff Stewart talked a lot about this, about the people who use these systems and how they have different user requirements across the museum. And I think that's really important to keep in mind. But just, you know, some things I'll throw out that I would like to see are generous interfaces. Um, a UX that's intuitive and that serves people across the institution. Things like integrated search and discovery, which uh, Richard actually mentioned a couple of times. It's kind of funny when I think about collection information at my museum and how to understand the collection, um, the notion of sending someone to the collection management system to understand the collection, that might be like the last place I would send them. Um, I would probably send them to the online collection. I would send them to talk to people. But the reason I wouldn't send them to the CMS is because the CMS comes at you with the assumption that you know a lot about the collection already. Um, and that's increasingly not the case as we move into stakeholders that, you know, maybe need just like a small slice of collection information, but are not experts. Um, they do not know our processes, they do not know our history. And so, yeah, without the CMS serving those purposes, there's a spillover effect into other systems. So things like online collections and dam systems, you know, I search for it in the dams because the search is better there, that kind of thing. Another, another thing I'd like to see is portability across operating system and device for these systems, you know, web-based everything. Um, how many people on this call who manage their work with these systems immediately found a user base who was working remotely a couple months ago? And how many challenges did that present for you? Um, certainly it did for us. And then finally, in terms of application design for these systems, um, I'd like to see some design that abstracts the data model away from the underlying storage mechanism and the data repository itself. So we're talking about things like, um, I don't know, MVC architecture, for example, so that, you know, as a system administrator, you could select backend storage or configure it in a way that fits into your tech stack without necessarily having to affect the front end of your application. Um, and in the end, you know, this creates opportunities to develop and customize interfaces way more rapidly um, without having to necessarily modify your underlying storage. Um, I'll say that content management systems are doing this like very well right now. Um, and we have some examples that we use. And finally, the last context I'll talk about is as a museum data enthusiast. Um, so one thing I would like to see is CMS systems recognize that museum data exists in the world outside of the system. Um, as Richard talked about a lot, there's many opportunities for museums to exchange data um, and aggregate data and work with data in different ways. So what I'm not implying here is that these systems should enforce a common schema because that's a whole hornet's nest that we need to tackle. 
But what they should enable is the ability to integrate widely used ontologies and taxonomies, especially as we moved into like the world of linked data, these kind of shared identifiers are everything. Um, and they're gonna become increasingly important. Um, I'd also like to see, you know, in support of that, these kind of ready-made import export functions. Um, I've worked on a few different projects that aggregate collection data. Um, the American Art Collaborative being one, um, the Linked Art Project being another. Um, and for a lot of museums, the barrier to participating in these projects is just getting data out of their systems at all in a way that can be worked with. Um, and a lot of time and energy is spent doing that still. A third thing I'll mention is I'd like to see some system integrated analytic and insight tools. Um, and again, like for heavy lifting, you'll probably want to go to a specialized tool for that. But a little business intelligence goes a long way in terms of kind of impressing upon your users um, the types of insights that are available for your collection holistically um, and raising questions that museums should be asking themselves these days. And finally, um, again, I'm borrowing again from Jeff Stewart here, make surprises possible in the CMS. You know, we shouldn't conceive of a CMS as simply a funnel into which we are pouring data and then pulling it back out for different purposes. Um, it should act something more like a prism through which interesting things are being reflected back at us sometimes unexpectedly. So to, to wrap up, you know, I'll throw out this question of like, why do I care about these things? Um, why, why do I want to see CMS systems improve in these ways other than selfishly, like I want my job to be a little easier. Um, and there, there are two things that I'll mention that are important to me. And the first of these has to do with the digital divide. I've been lucky to work at institutions like Princeton and the Met, which have the resources to support positions like mine um, and can build these bespoke web applications and processes to work with their data outside of the CMS. That's not true for most institutions. And so we end up with this notion of the digital haves and the have nots. That then leads to a second, you know, very, very important issue, which is that the story of museum collections as it exists today is the story of museum collections as it exists on the web, more or less. And so if that space is dominated by the types of institutions building the types of things that I build, then all of the biases of those institutions is perpetuated in ways that becomes normalized and becomes the totality of what we know about museum collections. Um, so th those are two things I want to keep in mind that I think additional work on CMS systems could really um, provide some benefit if we, if we thought about it. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you, Dan. All right, that brings us now to Dr. DuPont. Fantastic. And I probably don't have anything to say. I think most of it is mistakes. <laughs> but <laughs> um, no, this, this is absolutely great being here. I, I, I was, I've been here on the other webinars as well. And I think one of the take home messages from some of the earlier webinars was there was a need, there was this need for change or this need for an update in the system. We need a new system, but how do we prove that we need it? Where are the resources? How do we show the impact of the collections um, and the use of the collections within our institution? And we are, so the, the, the museum in London is, is very fortunate that we have, we are now on a journey to look at what we need, how we need it, and what can that provide. So we're in this, we are in this exact stage of dreaming of a new, new CMS. And all these things that, that Richard and Dan have mentioned about APIs and, and integration with, with the community, interoperability with the community, those become apparent, right? Um, one of the things that I think hasn't been touched upon, um, if I am to pick one or two things out, is, is metrics, it's impact. It is, it is showing that curators and researchers using the collection and how that filters out to the world, but it's also internally. So, so basically in my notes, um, where I've ticked off uh, a couple of things, is this, what, what we have now is a hot topic between the internal use and the external use of the CMS system. So internally, what we're looking at is we're looking at digital governance, right? We're looking at how do we federate, how we data federation within our institution. We've got multitudes of siloed systems. Arguably, the collections management system is at the core of that when you talk about curators and and researchers and the galleries, but we've got libraries as well. We've got the registry office, we've got um, research labs creating images. How do you start connecting the, that information? We've also got registries of all our 
of all our researchers and how what they're generating uh, of research. And if you can think of that new system, if you can envision those connections, and you can start saying, well, I want to be able to pull in those um, journals or those publications by these researchers, and I want to be able to link them with the persistent identifiers to the specimens they've been working on. And I want that surfaced, right? Or I want the decision-making boards to be able to see which parts of the collection are being worked on. And this is not, this is not about uh, keeping tabs on people. This is about understanding the impact of our collection and of, of our, our specimens or our artifacts to be able to track that. And that follows through to the external environment as well. Because what we're doing now is, is we're doing web scraping to an extent that's, that's unfeasible. We send out little, little bots that walk around and try to search for NHM and a unique identifier and try to link that back to our, our data portal, but it never goes back into our collections management system because that link has never existed. Our, our system is a silo in, in, in essence. So we've lost that traceability back to our specimens, um, which, which is very important for that. For example, for, for, the, for the metrics or for the impact analysis, or basically for understanding what specimens are being used for. Um, and then there's another, there's another fantastic thing when you look at the external potential of linking up systems and linking up collections, which is around data validation. It's about work efficiency and lightening the load on, on some of the not mundane tasks, extremely important tasks, but given the volume of specimens we have, it's unfeasible for curators to be able to do that um, for, let's say, 25 million insect pin specimens at the Natural History Museum. They cannot validate each and every one of those. But if that data can be surfaced appropriately, following standards or a number of standards that APIs can pick up, um, or that you can have platforms where people can annotate and provide their own sources of truth for that matter, um, then you start being able to incorporate that as long as you have the transparency for people to use those interpretations and continue the work on that collection where in, in the old days or before a time of the new fantastic CMS, a curator would have to pick up those specimens, ship them off, uh, hand them over or invite a researcher over and they might come over and discover that the specimens are half ruined or the legs they actually need or, or the painting that they, they want is, is actually not there or is, is misplaced. So you provide this visibility and this access for use. Um, but in many, in many cases, those links um, are somewhat some broken because we don't have the tools. We don't have the APIs, the standards, the schemas available. And that's one of the things that I believe we have the opportunity to do is to look at some of those, uh, a multitude of standards, a multitude of um, things happening within the community to understand how the times are changing and how we need to adapt or preempt those technologies so that when those are being used, we can surface our data, we can use that, and we can bring that back into our system. Now, this brings a multitude of, of different problems uh, with it, um, not only the amount of data that might come back when you surface millions of specimens or millions of objects to the world, you get twofold, threefold information back, potentially. Um, but it opens the doors for, for some things that are really, really interesting. Um, and I think I'm, I'm actually sort of, if I start thinking about other challenges, because I've ticked all the, all the links about um, uh, interoperability and, and API, which Richard and Dan have touched upon, I think data transparency is another thing that we can talk about, or data, data access we've already touched up upon. But data transparency, understanding what has happened to a piece of data and how that has been changed and being able to use that or comment on it in different circumstances. We all understand that the data that our institutions hold is being used in a multitude of different ways uh, for a multitude of different reasons. And some things may be relevant, some things might not be relevant. And being able to nitpick at that and, and use that, but then reporting that back transparently. So the next person can go, oh, this specimen has been used by so-and-so and so they've done that. They actually recommend that this painting is from a different era or this specimen was collected by a different person because the collector on the label obviously wasn't alive during that time. Um, so it must've been a different person. And then you can start correcting that and you can start enhancing that data 
uh, either automatically or through the curators. Um, so I think what I want to do is just backtrack a bit to the to the governance because what we had so through the discussions we had in the earlier uh, earlier webinars uh, and I was I was foolish enough that my first webinar I posted a long list of things I wanted to talk about data annotation round tripping um, I want to talk about APIs I want to talk about um, how do we share data free and openly um, and and thank you for acknowledging that list Alex. Um, and we did talk, talk about some of the points, um, but what, what we discussed further in those webinars was how do I prove to my institution that this is relevant, right? How do I, as a curator, as a, well, mostly curators, how do I say to the institution, we need to do this because this is really important. A lot of the times the CMS is the core of an institution, but it's not the moneymaker. It's, it's just the core. That is the data. That is what we have. And decisions aren't always made based on that. But if you create that transparency and that impact and you allow um, senior decision makers to see that and have visibility of that, that filters through and people will see and be able to make decisions and say, actually, we need a developer because we can see that a, a data portal or surfacing data is allowing three times more uh, researchers to, to visit us because they now understand what we have. Um, so we, we want to do that, or we want the ability to put in uh, conditions reporting into our system because that's really, really important to understand so that we're not wasting a lot of time walking around the collection trying to check each specimen. We've got a log of which things need attention or don't need attention. Um, so I think it's really, really important to create that, that visibility within the institution around the systems that we have to inform of us, of us the decisions to reach that goal of a future shiny new uh, CMS. Um, and then the last thing is every institution should be looking at their core requirements. And I can say that because we're doing that now, which is, and it's, 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 it's a long process, it's a hard process, but having that in the backhand and understanding the roles and permissions and the use cases uh, and the work process that they need really does help to create that vision of how do we safeguard a technology uh, towards things that might come in the future and use cases and not only some of the initiatives that we have globally we're working on on joint standards and big repositories where we can search across um, collections um, it helps to have that visibility of what a cms is for your institution i think i'm going to shut up now because i'm going to start going in circles um, and I'm probably better at responding to some of the questions that are going to come out of the woodworks. Thank you, Steen. That was great. Uh, before we open it up um, for Q&A from everybody, I know Jack has a few questions he would like to ask you, gentlemen. So I will leave it to Jack. Thanks, Alex. I, just a few out there, guys. I just want to throw a few things out there while people are sort of putting their ideas together. Um, so, Dan, one of the things I just wanted to ask you was this notion of you mentioned APIs. And clearly that that's, they've changed <laughs> over the years, right? And I'm just curious, like kind of what you've, what you've seen, kind of what, where, where it's been, where it's going and, and how you see that's transformed over the past. And by the way, Esteen and Richard too, please feel free to sort of chime in as well. But Dan, you just brought it up and I just wouldn't get your sort of take as to kind of where you see that stuff going and how many of us on this call might sort of look, look at uh, APIs in the future. Yeah, that's, that's a good question, Jack, um, because there are a couple ways to come at it, I think. There's, there's the notion of an API that's tied to the functionality of the system itself. And th those are the kinds of APIs that I am really interested in seeing um, because they, they enable you to do routine tasks in a way that's programmatic and build workflows around them. Um, so for example, like we're working on a project right now that's um, a digital asset management rollout of a new system. And that system integrates with our CMS. And so that system is sending data into our CMS, sending images as you know, new records for media related to objects. And so that's a function we have to do over and over and over again, every time there's a new image. And so we're writing a, you know, some code that triggers some database queries that do that work for us. In an ideal world, in my ideal world, that's something that like we would hit an API endpoint within that system itself that is you know create media record with a bunch of parameters and it would do that underlying work for us 
And that way, if the data schema ever changes, we don't have to rewrite our code. We just have to write our code to the API and we can trust that it's going to work. So, so that's, that's like the kind of real world example that I'm thinking about. And then there's obviously the notion of APIs coming out of these systems that are purely data APIs that really are just read only get me the data out of the system in a certain format. If I ask you a question a certain way, you will always give me an answer in the same way. And those are the ones that I think have great utility for getting to the last point in my, in my corner of this talk of leveling the playing field for people who are trying to build things with their collection data and get it out of the system in different ways and transform it. Cool, thanks. That's, that's super helpful to hear, great. Um, so Richard, this is a fairly obtuse, large obtuse question, but I have to ask you. <laughs> so um, a, lot of, of, a lot of what we're all tackling is sort of this notion of prioritization. When you start thinking about sort of the technologies and, the, and, the, and sort of thinking about what do you have to do first and what do you need to do second, as it were, like, do you have any advice or sort of insight as to how you tackle those types of prioritizations around technologies and those types of challenges? Is there something out there that you, is there, is there, is there a, a secret method for you that you're now going to provide to all of us as to how you sort of tackle it? <laughs> I think <clears throat> there's a secret method, but I suspect no one else would actually adopt it. Um, <laughs> we, we have been very lucky in that I, I started work with a body called the MDA, Museum Documentation Association, which was developing standards, which in fact came from a group of curators, and we were developing a multidisciplinary data standard for museum data. And this is back in the 70s. Um, and, um, you know, that standard had a natural hierarchical nature to it. So you asked curators to analyze stuff and they break it down. So you have, you know, an object, you break that down into how it was produced, you break how it was produced down into who produced it, when and where. And, and naturally, you, you end up with this hierarchy of information. So we had these, this mental picture of hierarchical standards. And as we moved from record cards that would actually let you record a structured record through to software that would support those standards, we look towards hierarchical data structures. Um, in the early days, we had to invent hierarchical data structures because there weren't any databases that did that. Um, but by the mid 90s, um, frameworks like SGML existed and then XML came along. So basically the idea we'd always had for data suddenly had an international standard that actually gave us that. So we basically moved quietly and step by step from a, a completely homegrown renegade sort of approach to our data through, through to it being um, quite respectable in that it's a standards based system, but it's also being XML so much a one off that I, I, I would be surprised if any other anyone else would actually look to build a, a, a collections management system based on that. I mean, I would say that obviously the standard relational model um, works on the principle of normalization. And that obviously is not what you get with an XML document. So an XML document is like a big blob. It's a lot of stuff all together. But for a lot of museum purposes, that sort of blobbing actually works quite well because you know you have these entities that you're interested in and you, you know that you're, there's an object you're interested in. If you can just go and grab all the information about that object as one thing, that's actually quite efficient. So I've actually worked with entity relational systems where everything is analyzed to the nth degree. And what, and what I found was if I wanted to actually pull back everything that you know about an object, it would take minutes because it was resolving all of these links where all the places the data are being scattered to had to all be unresolved to pull it back together. So in terms of practicability, um, our, our ad hoc model actually works pretty well for the sort of data that, that we're working with. Um, and I'd say the other direction of travel, which really interests me going on from there is this whole idea, which I think Steen mentioned, which is of linked data um, the, the, the idea that you actually take the resources you're interested in and give them an identity 
that transcends the immediate system they're in and can be instantly delivered out of that system to anywhere on the web and used for whatever purpose you want because what you're getting out is machine processable data in effect it's it's an api to a web scale database you know so it's a really powerful concept but obviously it's only powerful if the data's in there and uh, the challenge i see us having is to actually get that or convert our systems from being data strings to being linked data resources and it's you know it's an, a non-trivial ask but i think it's it's a worthwhile direction to move in thanks richard yeah that's um oh dan did you have a question to, to tack on to what richard yeah. richard's earlier point something that i think about constantly at this point in time is basically like are, are relational databases the best type of database for a collection management system and you know given the structure of museum data and the needs around like data models for museum data increasingly like i i lean towards maybe they're not maybe maybe like document-based storage which is you know quite practical at this point um might serve certain functions of a cms better you know I think I think I can touch. I think Dan's Dan's got a point there. We we are looking at that as well because we are the difference between uh, a document with metadata and an object with metadata, and and trying to fit some of that functionality or adapt a system um, for a different purpose is something we're looking at, and and I think that could could be or is promising, um, and that's not only because there are bigger sectors within within those those platforms. Um, but they've been doing some things for a lot of years with a lot of audits as well and a lot of integrity and a lot of, they already have a lot of, of of some of the functionality that we actually wish to have uh, AI ML uh, and all of those things and API is already there I mean a lot of them are are integrated services or, or minor services that are integrated by APIs already so a lot of that functionality is embedded in those platforms so I think there is great potential within within that mm. Yes, I mean, I, I've found in the past that the uniqueness of museum data often means that you're actually fighting the relational model because the relational model actually merges things which are seen as the same in a database. You often end up actually having to put in unique identifiers to force them apart again um, because they look the same, but to you, you know they're not because they're actually about two different objects. So, you know, you, you might actually find the relational model is, you know, to some extent, the enemy in, in certain contexts. And I think that a, a mixed approach, um, different technologies brought together can actually be helpful to us in, in trying to tackle this project. I don't think there's any one technology that's going to give us all the functionality that we need. I think we need to get them to work in harness. So, you know, if you're looking seriously towards the linked data direction, I think that, you know, you should move to a triple store and work within an environment that is actually designed for that job and not try and make your collections management data system into a triple store. Um, so <clears throat> you, you, you know, have the best tool for the best for the job that, that's at hand. Cool. I don't want to take a too far of a hard left turn, but I, uh, Steve, one of the things that when you were speaking, I, I wanted to uh, sort of ask you about is this the idea of um, what do you see as being, I'm going to converge governance and documentation. Like if there's something that just desperately needs to sort of be identified and sort of constantly nurtured during the process, they're thinking about all the technology touch points of the collection management system is there are is there government issues or documentation that you immediately are like oh yeah you got to go <laughs> you got to go here and you really got to make sure this is captured and well understood by not only the 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 primary point of contacts but then again sort of across an organization is there is there something out there that you sort of look to right away um so yes and that that sure is purely based on the on the approach that we that we took at the at the NHM London. It's such a big institution, and one of our main main concerns with with proposing the new system and trying to move to a new system um, is we have a lot of stakeholder groups that use the system for 
not different reasons, but in different ways. We've got a lot of different um, fields of study and they all do things in different ways. What we do have is we have a unifying um, way of working, which is, which is identified by, by spectrum. So the processes of spectrum, and Richard will be able to highlight that, um, those are ingrained in our system and those are the ways that we should handle and manage our collection. Now, having people agree around a process or a standard that the museum needs to follow has created a more frictionless discussion um, with opposing um, fields of study. And I think that approach has been, has been in incredibly valuable because if you go out and you ask a number of curators, right, um, what information do you need for an object, right? And how do you want to store it? There's going to be a, a plethora of things. Some people will have exact names, some people have interpreted names, and, and, and you can accommodate them all, but you end up provide creating data restrictions or losing all data restrictions to be able to handle something like that. Being able to say, right, this, this is the, the bare minimum, this is the standard that we're working at, let's understand that and then let's move upwards. So by doing that, we are also now being able to tackle um, with more trust, I think, tackling some of the bigger pictures with the community, for example. If we take a standard uh, like Darwin Core, we take a standard, we say, right, how does that fit in with the data we already have? Does it align or do we need to tweak something extra? If it aligns, great, no problem. If we need to tweak it, we can go ahead and, and try to tweak it. So that's really, really good and really helpful. And it provides um, a more, um, as I said, frictionless uh, approach to actually a, agreement, to, to reaching agreement with an institution. So I think st starting, starting um, I was about to say midway, because it's not, it's not, we're not starting at the bottom, we're starting at a, a, a governance compliance level, but we're bringing it down to the users and saying, right, how does this match with what you do? And then escalating it from there. I think that's been really, really helpful to us. Um, yeah. Cool. That's great to hear and sort of super helpful to sort of see that insight. Um, so something I, w I just wanted to respond to actually, um, it's a question for myself. So you all get to hear me answer my own question. Um, one of the things Dan that you brought up, which I think is super valuable, which is this idea, I, I'm oversimplifying, but there tends to be um, uh, an understanding of the UX of the user experience. And we sort of immediately go to the public understood that is where we want to go, right? Ultimately, how are we interfacing and providing sort of this useful frictionless uh, sort of experience for the, for the, for the visitor, um, for the constituent? Totally makes sense. But Dan, something you brought up just stuck with me and, and um, it, it, it sort of pokes and prods me constantly. And, and that's the sort of what's the UX for the staff, right? And, and you probably could see where my, where my head was at even with the journey map, right? This idea of like, how are our, our specialists coming in and interacting with each other, with the process, with the technology? Um, and I, ju I just wanted to say, it's more of a comment, I suppose, but, 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 but I hope it's sort of an interesting one and a useful one to just sort of remind all of us that that's useful. There's a utility to, to thinking about how are, um, how are all of us kind of interacting and I think even Dan, and now look, and I'm going all meta. I think you even talked about Jeff, you know, sort of Jeff had mentioned something like that. The idea of finding surprise within um, a system or sort of an internal system, I think is what a, what a sort of inspirational, sort of aspirational way of approaching it. So anyway, just, I love that idea and, and thinking about how do, you, how do you tackle those types of challenges? That's, that's really cool. Um, I, I, okay, I Alex, you're gonna open it up. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, I think that merges with quite a few comments that, that are in the chat around um, the existence of API um, in a lot of the systems that we have. And we have one of those systems. And yes, there is an API. Um, there are things beyond the API um, that make it hard to use the API. Things like permissions. And I think Dan brought that up. Um, things like uh, presidents and validation. Who gets to do what with that API? Uh, and how is that logged? Now, we we log everything. Our audit trail, I think, is about 250 million records at the moment. Uh, it logs everything, and we do that partially from a compliance perspective. Um, having an API with permissions and being able to set what people can see, can do, cannot do, 
allows us to open it up to internal staff because even internally we have those different roles and different things that people are meant to be able to see or not see. Um, so yes, we have had APIs for a long time. There is a, a there is an amount of work behind getting that to be usable and as well some decisions to be made. And that comes back to are the resources available and is that is that important? Is it important for one of our researchers to be able to log their specimens straight into the system when they're standing on a mountain in Malawi? Um, it, it would be great, it would be fantastic. And there is internet on mountains in Malawi. There's a lot of internet. I've had better coverage in Malawi than I've had in, the, in, the, in London, if we look five years ago. Um, so it's definitely possible. Um, but who's going to validate that if it's dirty data? If I'm standing and getting my, all my GPS is wrong, if I'm, if I'm trying to view stuff that I'm not supposed to, there needs to be some kind of, well, mild control or an understanding, a trust, I think, not control. I think it's more about trust. Uh, I'll tag on. That's awesome, Stephen, to know that there's internet available there um, in case I ever end up there. But one, one thing I'll tag on, again, in reference to what's going on in the chat is that, like, let's be clear that me, you know, collection management systems serve the institution um, and a wide array of users within the institution. And so me as a developer saying, man, I wish it had an API, let's just be clear, has little to no impact on our decisions about which collection management system we are going to use, you know, now and in the future. Um, that's, you know, that might not be the case always and I'm oversimplifying, it's certainly something we consider, but it cannot, it is not the driving factor for, for us or for any museum really that I know of. Great. All right. Um, well, thank you, Jack, for starting off with our questions. We'll move, and I know Steen kind of started and Dan started tackling some of the API questions already. Uh, Jack, there is a question in regards to the image you showed at the beginning, if it's available online, um, if you're able to share that. Please do so. Um, Sounds like a plan. I will. Yep. Okay. I just wanted to go through the chat real quick and just make sure we didn't miss any other questions. Um, I know there was one question in regards to um, if data if data analytic data analytics can help improve any aspects of collections management systems. Um, if so, what areas? Um, what areas do you think, um, and also if you see any scope of GIS to address any issues relevant to collections management systems, um, such as what uh, Richard was talking about around historical distribution of loaned materials worldwide. All right, go for it, Steen. Um, so data analytics, analytics and visualization is something that we are we've been excited about for a long time. Um, the creation of unstructured data within our systems and being able to look and say, show me all butterflies with pink, for example. Having, having a, a images analyzed for that kind of unstructured data can be quite valuable to your searches or, and this is probably mainly for, well, no, no, it's not. I was about to say it's probably mainly for researchers, but even if you're looking at conservation or, or, or status reports, right? And you understand that something will turn a specific color if it's getting old or damaged, or you are searching for specific things, that can be incredibly valuable. But where do you store that data? Is that collections data? Um, or is it associated data that you should have elsewhere? Ideally, you'd have a, a, a compartment or somewhere else that it can be stored within the collections management system or be linked to. Um, that's, that is, that is one of the discussions we are having now, um, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, and then GIS, yes, I mean, I would love to have loads of things validated across and with external sources as well. Uh, and hopefully that will come. Mm -hmm. right. Maybe GIS as such, but it's worth saying if you actually have access to um, sort of geographical linked data resource. I mean, even something like GeoNames, um, if you actually can include the URLs from that framework in your data, you basically get geolocation for free because <clears throat> the lat long of each place is part of the data associated <clears throat> with that URL. Um, so you, you can actually get 
value from linked data as well as actually contributing to other people's knowledge you can actually get a payback yourself in terms of the data other people have curated and which you're now accessing all right um i am not seeing any more questions in the chat um i don't know if there's any questions that you have for each other at this time i'll open it up for that i just i wanted to write raise something that i think chad brought up uh, in the chat just the notion of impact i i i'm i'm you can see a theme of things that sort of pique my interest um and that idea of impact and then I think the other piece to that is to do with value right and so and there is a distinction about you know what value can be found um I think again I, I'd just be curious to hear kind of uh for, from you guys kind of where kind of how you sort of um unravel that that notion of impact and, and that notion of value and and how can a collection management system help with that but right on, on a very sort of tactical level and a very transactional level there are ways to provide um, connections using technologies like APIs to to revenue, right? To to how you might connect it to a, a store or a shop, right? That's more of a of a of a value option, or or, 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 or as you might see it, or again more transactional. Um, and then as something I sort of brought up way in the beginning, this idea of how do you connect interpretive materials to a collection? I might argue that that's more sort of experiential, um, but certainly has impact. So anyway, I, ju I just wanted to kind of sit, bring that to attention again, because I think that there are some, um, I'll call them complications, challenges, opportunities around that. And so I wanted to sort of raise that. I'll, I'll, try, I'll jump in on that. Um, I think we all probably will. But you know, it's interesting that you bring up the notion of interpretive materials as a part of like a value algorithm or something like that, because we we've recently been reconsidering like the notion of like exactly where does the collection management system end? Like just because something talks about the collection, does it belong in the collection management system or is it better served in another system that can, can meet the needs of that particular type of content or data better? And so, you know, interpretive material is one of these things. And it's certainly something that in when considering what is the value of our collection, we would want to incorporate. But so are things like Google Analytics. But so are things like how many times has this been on the wall? And so it's this kind of question of, again, like I keep circling back to the, con the collection management system existing within a larger framework of systems that holistically give you a picture of like, what is your collection all about? Um, and what can you do with it and what can you learn from it? Um, and then again, on top of that, you know, putting something on top of that that can effectively meaningfully tell you that information in a way that's clear without just spitting out a bunch of numbers, you know. All right. I think, oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Richard. Uh, I think that, that brings us back to the point that was made earlier about data channels in and out. Uh, and the fact that many systems at the moment are actually rather bad at that very, very basic task. But basically, if you can have a, a data channel out, then you can have this sort of integration and feed it live data from the core system so that it's not just sitting there at one remove and instantly out of date as, as work progresses. Um, and, and again, if it can then have a channel back the other way, then you can have you know, the, the core updates that are required for the core system again happening automatically and that that approach of a multi-system um, design i think gives so much more possibility and, and lowers the bar as well i mean i, I did a talk for the cdoc conference which i called the overloaded cms and i think that there is this danger that essentially you as, as we're just being said you pile everything into the cms because that is the place that the data is meant to live and i think we need to actually break with that way of thinking and go to a more modular mindset so i i wanted to touch just because I, I i can see there's more questions coming in the chat touch on the the impact value and probably give two examples of, of some of the things we're doing um we have so our external view of our content content in our cms is through a data portal that is provided with data from our CSS, CMS about four times a week, right? And it presents that data to the world and you can, you can look at that. 
Um, through, so the Digital Collections Program took on digitizing the collections at, a, at, a, at an impressive scale and rate, but we needed to look at the impact of what it was digitizing, right? So are the specimens being used? Is the data being used that we are providing? Um, so we did start looking at site, um, how many things, sorry, things that are cited uh, in journals. Um, and are they our specimens? Which specimens are they? How many times are they cited? What's the impact value of that journal where it's cited in? Um, and then starting to, so we have this dashboard that presents the value of us creating digital data within the CMS. And it is quite valuable and it functions as a reporting tool of that program. Um, but I also wanna highlight one of the things that, and I believe Dave Smith is in the audience as well, um, who is a, is a data manager with, with years, more than 20 years of experience within the system we have now. And he's creating Power BI dashboards of our current data and how that's evolving. Where are the gaps? And as soon as you start seeing the gaps, you start being able to say, right, where, what are we gonna prioritize here? Is it worth us prioritizing um, these 10,000 um, records with missing data um, or is that not important right now? Should we be focusing on, on this comma that's been misplaced and is actually duplicating data across 100,000 specimens? Or maybe we should remove that comma. That might be an unfair um, um, comparison. I'll let Dave chime in on that. Um, but it allows us, it allows us to make those decisions when we can see that data and it can be interrogated in that way. And I think it's massively important uh, to create that link, that visual link, or just to be honest, that those numbers so that you can interrogate at a higher level and not just look at individual specimens. All right, so we, we do have a couple questions in the chat. Um, first from Neil Stimler, a fellow BPOCer. Uh, what do you think um, attendees from the webinar today can start doing to make forward progress on technical work um, in collections management systems? Where to start? Sorry. Who's first? Sorry, Alex. Can you just repeat that? I was uh, somebody wrote to me about something that I should say. Could you sure, no that? problem. Uh, what can attendees of the webinar start doing today to make forward progress on technical work in collections management systems? Uh, where to start? I think part of it is understanding what you're actually using the data in the collections management system for. Uh, what are the roles and what, who are the people using it? And potentially, who are the people not using it? Um, who are the people making the decisions that actually have no connection to your CMS and that critical core foundation of your institution or your museum? There are people making decisions that just don't look at it. And they should. Um, they should see it. They should understand what the impact is. And they should be making decisions based on that. So that might be one one thing that you could start or one could start looking at um, filtering through. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll second that, Steve, that one of, one of the things that I think everyone would benefit from would be to sit down and seriously think about like, what functions are, is my CMS serving and serving well? And which of these are like absolutely mission critical that they can never be extracted from the CMS? Um, and which of these are things that we're doing the CMS through because historically that's where we've done them or we just don't have another place to do them. Um, I think, you know, kind of a self-evaluation of that sort would be the best place to start. Um, and then again, you know, on a, on a bigger picture, just to sort of think expansively around, you know, the limitations of what a CMS could be. Um, don't, don't base your, your concept of a CMS on simply what's in front of you. Sorry about that. Um, all right, so our next question um, is from Ali Campbell. How do wiki-based softwares such as SF MoMA's Media Wiki fit in with current and future collections management systems? I know enough about that to be, to be dangerous. <laughs> I don't know a lot about it. Um, 
basically just, um, I think I read a, a couple of blog posts in maybe saw a presentation, but if, I, if I'm understanding that project correctly, it's around providing rich context around collection information, almost touching on what we were talking about before around like interpretive materials and things like that. And I think those kinds of systems, whether those are considered to be part of the CMS or ancillary to a CMS or just something else entirely, are going to become increasingly important to museums who have large collections and rich, deep information around them, being able to provide a single source of access for that kind of thing, regardless of where it's stored. All right. Um, so let's see. Ah, Jeff Stewart, one of our previous panelists from our last session. Um, I'll read his comment in the chat with the questions. Uh, just a thought while listening to this great discussion, I'm wondering if some of the issues we're discussing as technical problems are because institutions have poor documentation of their cataloging practice and workflow. How much institutional knowledge about collections and practice is locked in the minds of the staff? I keep getting stuck thinking that we're trying to use technology to solve problems that first must be solved by changing the, cultural, the culture of museums. Absolutely. Just drop the mic. There you go. Yes. Just boom. There it is. <laughs> we're, peace out. <laughs> yeah. We're not, we're not going to dispute that. Um, where, where does, does technology solve some of that? It provides, it provides a lower barrier to solve some of those issues and it, it, um, it disperses that knowledge. So it's not just your institution that has that one guy that knows everything. There might be somebody else out there that can look at that uh, information and provide that information as well on a specimen or, or an object. Um, but absolutely, I don't think any institution knows the full depth of what they do and how they do it and why they do it, um, because we've grown over hundreds of years to some of us or, or, or not, but we hold artifacts that are that, are that old. Um, and a lot of the time, a lot of our information is just of poor quality. We have so much missing data on our specimens and those gaps can sometimes only be filled by people who have been looking at exactly those things for a long time. Sometimes they can be filled by an AI. If you have a person collecting something and that person wasn't alive when the thing was collected, it's probably not that person that collected it. it must have been a person with a similar name, for example. So you, you can start teasing some of that out, uh, but that's something new that we can start looking at. That's not something we had before. Um, I think, so I have, and I'll just, I'll just dump this in here because it might not come up. A good colleague of mine in the audience as well, uh, highlighted a couple of initiatives that are actually going on within the natural sciences sector around standards and schemas and understanding what the community needs to do to come together to be able to share our institutional data across institutions on it, either on a single platform or, or, or more dispersed through institutions um, themselves. And there's a lot of very interesting discussion happening there. And I'm just going to post these links. Uh... All right. Oh, so, go for it, Dan. I just have one thought about Jeff's question, which is not an answer to Jeff's question other than just yes, Jeff. <laughs> but it's, it's a related thing that I think about, which is how much of Jeff's question about museum culture and workflows is actually at this point in time driven by the CMS itself. Like how much of our cataloging practice is geared around the boxes that are put on a screen in front of us and on how many of our workflows are determined by like the, the workflow built into that system. Um, it's this kind of, you know, circular thing that I, it's just a thing I think about a lot. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that's sort of where, where I came in with that, my whole sort of introduction to this topic, because um, in a way, what we're trying to do with the mode system is actually put some of those boxes in front of our users in a way that they haven't had in the past. So I've been asking one of our small local museums about what they actually do with modes. And, um, you know, the basic cataloging, that's fine. But when you get on to exhibition management and that sort of stuff, they, they rush off and they use spreadsheets. You know, they, they sort of finesse their way out of the system and they, they produce something gloriously ad hoc and homegrown. And, and that 
is the challenge that I think the developers of systems have that if they can actually provide a tool that's easy enough to use and is so directly what the person actually wants to do that they switch through and use the tool because it's actually less work than inventing their own homegrown system then I think you might start to align the practice of the museum with at least what the designers of the collections management system at least had in mind even if that's not exactly what the museum management themselves might want but then that's about how you align the system with your operational practice which is another challenge and you know to what extent that can actually be customized to the needs of each museum well we have about five minutes left um so i will end this with chad weinard's question i don't think we have any more um a follow-up question is can improved infrastructure improve museum culture well i'm an optimist i would say yes i would say that um, there's a lot of scope for doing things better getting the data more consistent um getting the data so it falls under your feet as you're doing the job and is available when you need it there's a lot of design that we can do to improve the systems we've got um, and i think a lot of that has to come from the users feeding in um, we certainly find it's a massive challenge getting any of our 650 museums using modes to actually say what they want to actually you know put those requirements there in front of us and to some extent we're having to do a, a design job in the dark you know well surely this will be good for them we do this and and that's not ideal where we're working to improve that dialogue right now but um there is there's always that challenge but i think unless the users stand up and shout um then you're going to find the vendors are quite slow to actually move things in a, in a way that is going to help them absolutely uh, i think so sorry um i'm, I'm I'm not going to say whether improved infrastructure can improve the museum culture, but for us, the journey towards an improved infrastructure has had huge impact. So we have, and I'm, I'm saying this because I really hope it's true, re related to the program that I'm doing, but the workshops that we're running with a number of different curators in their own fields and uh, exhibition staff and the conservationists, when, they sit, when they're sitting there and talking about the processes they're doing and how they're working with the collection and understanding and discussing that between themselves has had a huge impact, I think, on the understanding of what the institution does and how it does it and has allowed them to understand each other. And then possibly more anecdotally, we have had, um, we've had we have curators and researchers who do more very similar things. Curators do research too. And I know that's more general in the US. It isn't so much in our institution. But understanding one of the reasons why our researchers actually weren't engaging with our CMS was very interesting because part of it was they didn't feel safe. They wanted to engage with the CMS and they wanted to put data into the CMS. But they, they acknowledged that in some cases they weren't the experts and they hadn't been trained that well. And the thought of them being able to change a thousand records by putting in something wrong actually kept some of them away. Now, this is not speaking for all the researchers, but that was very interesting. And trying, so what we're trying is trying to lower that barrier or provide a safe space, right? That you can work in and you know that you're not going to change that. And then once you're comfortable with that, yeah, we can put that data in uh, to the rest of the CMS, for example. So I think understanding the journey to the infrastructure can definitely improve, uh, but that's understanding the museum will improve museum culture. So I'm probably skipping a, a step there. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today for this amazing discussion. Thank you, Richard, Dan, Steen, Jack, for your time today. It has been a real treat. I have been enjoying this webinar series and helping to moderate it so much. Um, with that said, we are at time. so. Everyone, this session's recording will be available on all of our social media channels. I will be sharing it back out on our list, on the listservs that we promoted the webinar series on. So please keep an eye out on that. 
Um, if you are interested in participating in any future panels, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I'm more than happy to discuss that with you. All right. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day and we will see you next time. Okay, cheers. Thank you. Thanks all.